Tesco's Kitchen and um, famous from the band The Members and a thespian, an artist of true calibre, Nick Tesco. Hi. And you went to Liverpool University or what? Yeah, I went to Liverpool University in um, 72 and I sort of, it, I remember the 70s apart from stuff Apart from stuff like, like Lou Reed and Bowie, and I did, you know, I'm going to confess, I liked some of the black, I liked sweet singles and things like that, but my, I was kind of quite seriously into music, and I'd always been this massive Stones fan, and I remember a quote from Eric Burden once, where Eric Burden said, if you want to do anything in music, you know, the only people who really understand music are the people who collect it, the people who listen to it, the people who love it. And, you know, through the Stones and the Animals and all that period, I'd, I'd kind of got into the blues. I'd discovered people like Can Heat in the States, as well as, you know, John Lee Hooker and all the traditional blues guys. But um, my memories of the kind of that period of British music was the tedium, absolute fucking tedium of it. You know, it was, yes, uh, prog rock. Um, I mean, funny enough, I... I've kind of shared memories of things like this with them. Um, I remember my brother buying me the first King Crimson album because I'd heard 21st Century Schizoid Man, which I thought was really exciting and assumed the whole album was going to be like that. So I got the album, first track 21st Century Schizoid Man, and then there's all these dreadful, woeful prog noodling. And I was like, oh, God, I think it hardly got played. I like the artwork. Um, but it... It always seemed to me, even still when I look back on it, it's endless albums of, you know, the guitar player from some dodgy band making a solo album and all his friends were playing on it and then, and nothing was, was really happening. Um, they all sat down cross-legged, weren't they? And each song would last about 20 minutes. Yeah, I mean, I still love, through all that period, I loved the Stones and that was probably oh. what I played the most, you know, yeah. Beggar's Banquet, Let It Bleed, Exile from Main Street. And in fact... I was quite into acid a bit, you know, it's a teenage drug, I guess, even still, you know, um, and, but I remember being a student and doing acid and we'd go out drinking in dockside pubs and hanging out in clubs and stuff. I guess we were like the forerunners of the Scallies in some ways. And, uh, but we went around to this guy's place one time to pick something up and I was off my head as was one of my mates on acid, and he was like, oh, you better sit down, and I said, and what music should I put on? And we go, oh, you got any stones, you know? Oh, you can't listen to stones. And it was, that was, I think, the first time, I went, well, there's a dividing line here. There's this kind of, there's people who want it all noodly and soft, and there's people like me um, and my friends. And we never really had a home. And around about, I'd say, what, 74, 74, 75, you know, that whole kind of... It's called pub rock, but I don't think it actually does it credit, you know, because you can't really... You know, we were talking earlier about Kokomo. Kokomo, I'd put as part of that. Um, feel Goods, Kilburn and the High Rose. I mean, Jesus, Ian Dury in those early days. I mean, the first time I saw Kilburn and the High Rose... I mean, I'm, I'm worse now than I was. I've had a rheumatoid arthritis all my life. Um, so, hence... You know, I walk with a stick these days and I'm, my hands quite buggered. But in those days, I was still this young, svelte, proto-punk rocker, you know, and I I went into um, the, the big hall at Liverpool Uni where Kim and the High Rose were playing, and I was just speechless. I thought, this is, at the time, one of the most exciting things I'd seen. You know, there was this kind of really aggressive raspberry ripple there was a guy on drums who used crutches. Um, there was a person of short, of what they call it, the nice way of saying it, of reduced stature or whatever, on bass. There was Davy Payne on saxophone who looked like he'd just been released from an institution. And they were incredible, you know. They were just like, oh. And I had the same effect with... Um, well, with Kokomo, who were obviously much smoother and sexier kind of breed, but there was a power to their playing. Um, 
same with feel goods. And I thought, well, you know, this actually speaks to me. This is, you know, all the songs were quite short as well. Even like, you know, the funkier workouts, they were shorter, you know, and you kind of thought, wow, this is, is sort of saying something. And then one of my friends turned up in 1975 with the first Ramones album on import because we had a it's still there actually Probe Records it's like the rough trade of Liverpool fantastic record shop I recommend if you come from Liverpool go to Probe Records support your uh, independent record shops because you know if they go you'll never have genius musicians anymore or you won't discover like I did reggae you know, I discovered reggae in about 72 when I went into pro and they were playing a big youth album and I went, oh my God, what's this, you know? I just check it out, Nick, you know? Mm-hmm. I went off with that and then I came back the next day and bought more and more, you know, and that was it. So it wasn't like just a London thing, you know, reggae was discovered by a whole community of young people out there who had grown bored about what, I guess you could say, what Anglo-Saxon music was doing at the time on the whole. In the 60s, and we had Blue Beat. Yeah, well, yeah, and it was very working class, yeah. Scar and Blue Beat. Um, the mods. Classic. And Skinheads as well, you know, and when Skinheads before it became such a, you know, a NF, BMP kind of thing, okay. So when, you, when you came back from um, Uni and Liverpool, did you start the members straight away? No, I, I sort of tried to start a band in Liverpool um, with an American guy and when I was away he, uh, he died of a drug overdose and he wasn't actually a drug user in that way. He was trying it for the first time and someone thought it'd be funny to give him a, get him really knocked out and they killed him. Um, so he kind of went on the back burner and then I tried to emigrate to Canada and I wanted to work as a DJ over there. and I'd, you know, there was me doing my road trip with a huge suitcase full of vinyl dragging this thing around with me. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said for uh, iPods and stuff, isn't there? Uh, you know, you just carry more than I even carry. But, you know, people hadn't even in Canada just had no idea what I was playing, you know. And so I was getting off the gigs. And, so you're playing the Reggie out there? Yeah, very much so. You know, um, you know Mighty Diamonds, you Roy you know, Kapazuki, all that kind of stuff. It was all happening. Mm-hmm. And um, and then they, uh, the Mounties came and knocked on my door one day and said, time to go if you want to apply. Yeah, well, they know, because I didn't recognise them. They said, oh, we're a Royal Canadian Mount of Palouse. I said, no, you're not. You're not wearing red jackets, you know. And that didn't really help. But, but I was told they'd come back to the UK to apply, and then I applied, and they turned me down, which is sort of just as well. And uh, I was working at the other job, you know, people.